Hello and welcome to the beautiful track of Mazzano, a circuit perhaps best known for the exploits of Valentino Rossi and his Motor GP colleagues. But this weekend it has been electrified. 22 Formula E drivers are ready to show who is the fastest on this brand new track ahead of round six of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. And I'm absolutely delighted to say that joining me for this incredible ride here in a glorious afternoon in Mazzano uh, is the Scottish sensation, former F1 driver David Coulthard, uh, a kick-ass um, Andretti Extreme E driver, Katie Munnings, and I couldn't think of what to call hey. you, Karun. So just former F1 and e, former E driver, Karun Chanter. I've been called worse, I'll take yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> equally kick-ass. The Oracle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, guys, it has been an amazing start to the 10th season of Formula E. We've had five different race winners in the five races so far. Um, Karun, where is it going to go? It's looking incredibly tight. It is incredibly tight. And I think this is a, a unique circuit for the calendar. I think, uh, you know, it's a new track, obviously, we're coming to for the championship itself, but also just the layout of the circuit is quite different to, to everywhere else. Um, I think we're going to see lots of big, wide uh, wheel to wheel racing with cars maybe three, four abreast uh, at times. Um, you've got some tight chicanes, they've got to squeeze through with the walls being quite close, but I, I think we should be in for a cracking weekend. Well, someone who's already got to grips with this track, DC, you were out earlier in a rather fast-looking Maserati. How was it? Yeah, I got the full electric experience in the <laughs> Maserati. Lots of acceleration, but in 2.2-tonne car, braking distances a little bit longer than they're going to experience in Formula E. But uh, as Karun's just said, I think this is two little reminders. It's Formula E with the, the second, third, fourth sequence of uh, chicane with a nice concrete wall on the left and likewise <laughs> down uh, eight and nine. Otherwise, this is high speed heaven. It's therefore going to be battery management hell, but uh, I think it's going to lead it to lead us up to some good racing. Yeah, it's going to be quite intense because this is a double header race weekend. Uh, so it means, of course, go racing Saturday and Sunday, but Sunday's race is two laps longer. So it's going to be really critical with energy management. Um, but let's cast our memory back. Not that long ago, we had the inaugural Tokyo Epri and wow, what a race it was. Um, Katie, talk us through the fantastic wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, the really tight competitive nature between Nick, uh, between, sorry, Max Gunter and Oliver Rowland. Yeah, I mean, those street circuit races are so entertaining to watch as a fan, how close they are to the barriers. Um, I think Formula E does that so well, and, and I was glued to the TV for that race. <laughs> I think they had a really great strategy, you know, Maserati and Max able to overtake and take the win. But as you say, it is so tight between all the teams here, a completely different type of circuit here. So I'm sure that we're going to see those energy strategies really coming into play this weekend. Yeah, it was a fantastic moment for Max Gunter and the Maserati team, who can now come into this race weekend, which is kind of uh, officially their home race. They've also got Monaco is their other official home race uh, because their headquarters are about, well, two hours down the road in Moderna. Um, Karun, if you were to put your bets on, who's going to be winning this race? You're joking, it's Formula E. <laughs> I'm not betting on anything before the weekend. Um, no, I, I, think, I think this is a, a race genuinely very different to everything we've seen so far this season and therefore, um, you know, the, the form guy kind of goes out the window because the reason... Max Gunter and Oliver Olin were able to do what they did in Tokyo it is the same as we've seen in, in races like Jeddah, where the tracks have been narrow, they've, they've had the opportunity to save a whole lot of energy in places, but here they won't have the luxury, so it's going to be different for all these people at the top of the championship. Well, indeed, let's take a look at the championship standings, because they have actually changed quite a lot since Tokyo. Pascal Verlein propels himself to the top for the first time with 63 points. Nick Cassidy, though, just two points behind uh, his first season, of course, at Jaguar TCS Racing. They're not far behind. We've got Oliver Rowland, who's moved from sixth up to third, and Jake Dennis, reigning champion there. There, one point behind on 53 points. And you can see again, Max Gunter in at the top for in, in fifth position there. Things are, are changing, but ultimately it's consistency in Formula E that's going to win you that championship. And that is what the likes of Pascal Varnin very good at.
Yeah, and I think actually looking at a double header, um, it can't be taken for granted that you're going to be quick one day and then you're, you're going to be quick again the next. We've seen it so many times in Formula E. You know, you're on the pace on the first day, struggling on the second day. And I think it's because how close the racing is. We're talking thousands of a second still between all the manufacturers and the different powertrains out there. It's, I don't think there's many championships in the world where that's the case anymore. No, quite probably quite different to your Extreme E experience, that's for sure. Well, as you can see, uh, Korea DC have pegged it to the commentary box as FP1 gets underway. Yeah, thank you very much, Nikki. Thanks, Katie, as well. Very much looking forward to free practice one, the first time to see all 22 drivers out on track here in Mazzano. A brand new stop on the Formula E calendar. Of course, we've been uh, in Rome before this, back in season four, all the way up to the end of season nine. Now we're here at Mazzano, of course, a permanent race circuit. And looking forward to seeing what is going to happen here this weekend. A lot of unpredictability in Formula E in general in 2024. And that's said to be the case here this weekend as well. Of course, a new circuit circuit not very many heavy braking zones on this track in particular as well so energy management is going to be absolutely critical earlier on this afternoon we had uh, rookie free practice taking place where 11 rookie drivers none of whom have raced in formula e before were out on track one driver per uh, 11 teams and then uh, they decided to of course go around the circuit 30 minute session and uh, we saw what the pecking order was the upshot is it was neil mclaren who were quickest with Taylor Barnard. Let's see whether they're going to be able to repeat that feat here this afternoon. Here is Max Gunter, the winner from Tokyo just a couple of weeks ago. Amazing performance from him in the MSG Maserati. As Nicky was alluding to, of course, a bit of a home race here for the Maserati brand. And, of course, in uh, Monaco in a couple of weeks' time, it'll also be a home race for the MSG team as well. So, drivers now out on track as they begin their uh, first runs on this Mazzano World Circuit. Marco Simoncelli, David Kilthard and Karun Chandler joining me here in the commentary box. Lads, looking forward to this one. DC in particular, a new challenge for the drivers. What do you think we're expecting here this weekend? Well, I had the opportunity to do a couple of laps in uh, one of the uh, Maserati fully electric broadcasts, which I would say thoroughly enjoyed. Um, <laughs> Not only for uh, giving me an opportunity to see around this Misano track, but uh, to try and sort of get myself in the cockpit of what the drivers have been experiencing. So down at this 8-9 section, this is typical Formula E, isn't it? Make a mistake, you are embedded in the tyres, very unforgiving. And I think there's so much of Formula E has, has been sort of favouring the drivers that feel comfortable on those very tight, tidy race tracks. Three, two, one. Full course yellow, full course yellow. And that's race director Scott Elkins there just doing a full course yellow practice, usual sort of procedure that we have in free practice one, but carry on. Yeah, so while they go through that procedure, and it's all good, good learnings for the drivers, um, it's this open section. Everything that isn't two, three, four, and eight and nine, it's, it's normal racetrack. And you've got you know, so much runoff as well. Are we going to be in a situation where track limits are going to be penalised, or are they, are they just going to leave it yeah, so it's completely open to the individual? The okay, attention all teams. Oh, this is race control. Full course yellow ending in five, four, three, two, one. Green flag. Green flag. Yeah, the way I understand it, Corinne, is that track limits are sort of going to be police, but they're going to give them a fair bit of leniency, the drivers, this weekend. I don't actually know what that means. <laughs> 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 We saw you either police, you either have a rule or you don't. So I'm not sure about the sort of police. I, I, I'm not blaming you. I, I believe that is what they've been told. Um, but honestly, as a person watching, and, and actually if I was competing as well, I, I would like to just know that it's being policed everywhere because there's consistency. Um, that's kind of, I think, what we want, isn't it? Well, that's, I think traditionally you'd see drivers, you know, if you stray two wheels past the, the white line, that's OK. But if it's four wheels past the white line, that's the, the limit of the circuit. But, for example, when we had rookie free practice earlier on this afternoon, we had uh, Taylor Barnard, who was out on track. He went completely wide at the final corner off the circuit and, you know, was still classified second fastest time. Yeah, he was almost in San Marino. <laughs> he was so far <laughs> off track. So, you know... In my other role, uh, I often get very frustrated with the overly strict uh, sort of regulations of the of the white line. I get it; the rule book says the white line defines the racetrack, but the cars will find a natural point between sort of entry and exit apexes, and I think largely you can kind of just leave them to get on with it. But it does seem here that does leave it open 
very much to, well, do you keep going to the gravel? <laughs> what is the point where you've reached the I mean, limit? No. That. Oh, ridiculous. come on. That's <laughs> well, I look, that's probably a bit too far, would you not say, Karun? Yeah, but if we were in the car, we'd do the same, wouldn't we? And that's why I think the rules you need would, to be... You would, you sneaky, <laughs> lap time grabbing <laughs> individual you... <laughs> Times have changed. He's though. not even denying it. No, no, no of course not. <laughs> why would I? 100% I'm going to do it. It's going to be an interesting circuit this though because it's, it gets quite tight here, you know, through three and four and then it's so fast and flowing for the rest of it. I was talking before you guys got here, energy management is going to be critical here this weekend. There's only really one big heavy braking zone of eight and nine. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this is what this practice is all about really. It's, it's a just, you know, they want to get their energy targets, they want to make sure that the numbers they've come up with in the simulator is correct and it correlates with what, what they've got on the real track. Um, you know, they're going to have a run at doing some fast laps towards the end of the session, but this is very much about getting some, some data in, in terms of energy management. Yeah, I understand that Eddie Mortara won't be taken to the uh, start of this session. In fact, won't be competing in FP1 at all uh, due to battery-related problems with the Mahindra, which is a big disappointment for him because he was sixth on the road in Tokyo a couple of weeks ago, ended up getting disqualified for energy overuse and not the start to his home weekend as he sees he's uh, raced under a Swiss license but he's half Italian as well not what he would have been wanting here in uh, Lozano just looking at Jake Dennis and Norman Natto they're exploring the limits of the circuit shall we say into 12 yeah well look if if this is the race director's position then you know that will become used to it it just visually doesn't look right <laughs> um, to be stealing so much of of the racetrack but maybe they're taking the view like I just said, the, the, the drivers will find their own natural point of entry limit and exit limit, and they'll be, well, as they've run a little bit wide, I think, uh, down, was that down into turn two? Now, I was interested, you're saying there's only really a big breaking at turn eight and nine. I think you're right in terms of max energy, mm. but the way I see it, certainly if I was driving, there's a reasonable break into one, a reasonable break into five, reasonable into six, eight, nine, as you've identified, and then uh, 12 as well. So it, it, it's, yeah. It's not a series of short straights and big hairpins, but there, there's, there's definitely recoverable energies, uh, areas on the track. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and also, it was interesting watching those two Andretti cars going around, because what they were doing there is running with one car right behind the other in the toe. So Jake, Jake Dennis there picking up the, the toe. So they get energy targets support. This was up at... Yeah, that's... That's McLaren, that's Jake Hughes just exploring the limits of, uh, of eight and nine. Did that car not do exactly the same in free practice? That was uh, Kyle Collett, actually, in the Nissan who went oh, off there. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he, Different he, colour car completely. <laughs> <laughs> just discovered I'm colour blind. <laughs> Help. But, uh, yeah, no, it's interesting, actually, because drivers are saying, you know, that corner, if you do make a mistake, there's only one option, and that's, you know, going off onto the gravel, which, you know, if Casey Mullins was driving, perfect. But, you know, if you're in a Formula E car, not ideal. No, nobody likes gravel rush. No, I mean, uh, especially, yeah, mechanics, but uh, here's Max Gunter coming into that corner that you talked about. It seems a bit bumpy, actually, under braking. It seems like a change of surface just in that braking zone. The car, the front of the car seemed to do a little hop as he um, got in that deceleration zone, which was interesting to see. Yeah, into 12. Be on a bit of a crest of, a, you know, confidence as well following that win a couple of weeks ago. Amazing performance from, from Max Guns, a team that's been in, a, I don't want to say turmoil is probably the, not the politest way of putting it, but they've been in a, a fair bit of bother over the winter with a lot of personnel changes and so on, and Max Guns has sort of steadied the ship, he's put in really good performances, that being evident when we saw him take that victory in Tokyo last time out. Confidence will be riding high going into this weekend. Drivers have short memories. <laughs> all, of, all of the difficulties are definitely uh, have been overwritten with a bit of performance and uh, yeah he'll be trying to carry that into this weekend a very different race weekend looking here into uh, the Andretti uh, pit lane this is Jake Dennis and then we cross over to see Robin Freitz oh really wide at the final corner let's see what the time's going to be as he comes across the timing line goes up to seven fastest loses time in that final sector but uh, still an improvement for him. Envision, really tricky weekend for them last time out, actually, <laughs> uh, in Tokyo. Sebastian Buemi, 13th on the road. Robin Freitz, ninth position. You know, considering they were the reigning team's champions, they've not had a particularly fortuitous start to the year, Karun. No, and, uh, you know, as you said, they, they were the team that <clears throat> were 
consistency was their strength last year, wasn't mm. it? Especially after the first sort of three weekends when Jaguar then found their feet. We see he's off to the beach there, but uh, carries on, finish the lap. Um, once they found their feet, you know, they were super quick yeah, and consistently super quick. So they have lost Nick Cassidy, of course, and Robin Fry is coming back into that team. It, you know, it's not, he got a podium already this season, but it might take a little while to, to get settled in. Edward Montreal is sitting there, keen to go. That's the sort of uh, commitment you normally see in a teenager at a cart track, <laughs> helmet on. <laughs> I'm sure, I can't imagine that from being told that it's time to get in the car, that it can take him that long to put his helmet on. Especially, it's quite a hot day as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, extra uh, training. Yeah. He's used to it, I guess, isn't he? He's Italian. It's usually <laughs> a sign as well, don't talk to me, isn't it? A racing driver leaves a helmet on. Yeah, yeah but he's, you know, he's surrounded by friends in the big Surely well, he wants a chance. You would think so, but maybe. Is there a rift there? <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of rifts, actually, this man's a gentleman we should talk about, Antonio Felix da Costa. There's a uh, few rumours sort of bubbling under the surface here this weekend that his relationship with Porsche has become strained, shall we say. We understand that uh, Nico Muller tested that car, and there's an eye of a possibility that he may be looking to take that seat before the season's over. You're so diplomatic, strained. I, I heard broken. <laughs> That's another word that I heard as well. I'm trying to be the voice of Carmen <laughs> Rees. <Rinsen's team. laughs> well, we should just go ask him, shouldn't we? He's the boss, Florian Modlinger. Is it strained or broken? Well, that's the crucial question, isn't it? And it depends on who you talk to. I'm sure we'll, yeah, I'm sure we'll find out a little bit more about the relationship between Porsche, De Costa, Modling, and also Muller as well. I'm still going to come out in the wash at, at some point in particular. You know, I, I heard some rumours that maybe he's not going to be completing to the end of the season with the team, and also then other rumours about Muller and whether he'd have permission to test the car and so on and so forth. So, time will tell. The thing is, we had a rookie test earlier today, and you had drivers like Taylor Barnard, you had Paul Aron, you know, these are quick young drivers racing in Formula 2 at the moment, who would all have an eye on a seat here. So mm. if there are fractures in the relationships between any of the teams or drivers here, um, there's a whole plethora of drivers knocking on the door. And that, that is always, you know, that's always the case in, in motor racing. So you've, you've, at the end of the day, if you're delivering on track and the performances are strong, there's no risk. Yeah, absolutely. Let's have a look here. This is uh, Stoffel van Dorn, and we'll get down to the pit lane for the first time with just under 17 minutes of the session. I catch up with Saunders, who is with DS Penske's Phil Charles. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I thought, you know, very strategy dependent race coming up. Very important to get that strategy right. So why not talk to the strategy guru himself, Phil Charles, what are your thoughts? What's gonna be needed to win this race? Well, you're absolutely right. This is gonna be a race where we call it the peloton effect. Um, you've only got so much energy and these laps are long laps. You've got to save a lot. So if you start the race and you slow the pace down, it effectively means you end up having more energy towards the end of the race to use per lap. And that means I can hold a guy behind me if I've got more energy much more easily than if, I, if I've got less energy to use. So you'll see that people strategically slow the race down. They won't want to lead, and if they do lead, they'll slow the race down a lot. And that's what kicks off the peloton effect. We're all jostling for position because we don't want to lead, or we want to slow the race down, and that backs the, the pack up. So you're going to see two very, very strategically interesting races. The drivers have to get their elbows out at certain times in the race and position themselves to be able to go to the front at the key time when it starts to lock out. So it's going to be two interesting races. The drivers have got a, a big part to play, but also the teams have to prepare those drivers and make sure they understand the race that's ahead of them. Uh, and as it unfolds as well, the pace, as it slows down more or less, when that point of inflection or that point of lockout starts to come. So two very interesting races. Got to prepare well and then be ready to get the elbows out. Excellent insight, as always. Thanks, Phil. No problem. Catch you later. Yeah, thanks, Aldous. Okay, thanks to Phil Charles continued. as well. Thank Just you. looking here at Maximilian Gunter, who's come to a stop at turn 12. Let's have a look on board. You can see he's off the circuit here, off the racing line. And computer says no by the looks of things. The question is, can he get that car? Oh, he has been dealing going again. That's important, actually, because otherwise there'd be a red flag thrown there and it would cost the drivers a fair bit of running. Yeah, not far away from that final turn 14 and the pit lane entry just before it. Yep, Sebastian Buemi now in the pit lane as well. Teammate Robin Freitz as well. I uh, just want to talk about team strategy. We saw that at the locker room in Tokyo. We saw the two Porsches working together. We saw the two Andrettis working together. Do you think, given the nature of this race being this different in terms of strategy, we're going to see the same? 
I think it's going to be harder to do because okay, I think the, 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 the order gets more and more stopped jumbled up. You're going to have stopped at the entrance of the pit entry. All oh, right, so good. It hasn't made it back to the pit. Right. Okay. Um, you're going to have more cars. So you know, yes, you can control your two cars. Maybe if you're aligned in terms of your manufacturer partner team, you can control four cars. But in a race like Portland last year, where we saw yeah, guys, you know, you people going from like sixth so into the win, it, sorry, right into the lead in one right move, you can't control all of them, right? So I think it's it's going to be harder to orchestrate in a in a situation here than it was, for example, in Tokyo, where we saw teams working together quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, if we look at we're expecting this to be a Portland-style race, you know, similar sort of circuit in terms of you know being very wide and very fast and very flowing. Okay, that car we is have drivers going. Pit entry is open now. Thank you, guys. Okay, so there we are. Good suspension. Let's get back into the pit lane, and uh, that's all good. So, good news there for him. Unfortunately, for coming to a stop, not so good. But um, yeah, I mean, if we look at Portland last year, DC, we saw drivers going from sixth to first in the space of a quarter. And given the width of this track, there's a very good possibility down the start, finish straight, down the back straight, we can get four wide. Yeah, absolutely, and it's a reasonable run from the exit of turn 14 to the start finish line. So we could well see, like we've seen at some of the other events, um, a last moment uh, overtake if someone's just running out of energy. We haven't really talked about the fact that a lot of drivers have never been here before. Mm. But I think about we, we were trying to work it out, weren't you? It's a good portion of the lost the power. Did you, have, did you have any alarm on the dash? We don't know the answer. No, no we don't. We've run don't. out of battery <laughs> for the radio, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully they can find a uh, control alt delete and get them back out on track. So how many have been here, Tom? Uh, let's have a look. So Jake Dennis has raced here because he was here in DTM. Norman Nasso has not. Uh, Sebastian Buemi has raced here. Do you know he's the only driver to have raced in the previous configuration when the track went in the other direction back in 2006? Uh, really? Right. Yeah. I know, that just goes to show his age, doesn't it? Or experience, that's probably the politest way of putting it. Um, Freitz has raced here as well. Uh, a few other drivers, uh, Mortara, Muller, Jake Dennis, and so on and so forth. So there's a good few drivers that have got some experience here, but obviously this configuration of track is not the usual Mazzano World Circuit configuration. Yeah, but at least they'll know the bulk of it, apart from the first three corners. You know, they, they will have a, a sense of it, um, and that, that will be helpful for FB1, certainly, just to get in the groove. So, uh, Sergio set the camera here. We're looking at... Yeah. It's been the shining star of ERT so far this year, the only point scorer in that team. So, just under 12 minutes now remaining of free practice one. See that Pascal Verlein we look at here, the championship leader, stole it off Nick Cassidy in Tokyo after uh, a bit of an interesting showing for uh, Nick Cassidy down in eighth place. Not Jaguar's day, we saw his teammate Mitch Evans ending up in the wall. And of course, no points on the board as a result of that. Verline, meanwhile, uh, getting himself into uh, fifth position at the chequered flag. Enough points for him to take over the lead of it. I think well, that chicane is tight, isn't it? It is. Like, and the curb on the inside, on the right-hand side, is quite big. If you misjudge that, uh, you know, I think it, I can see drivers, if they take a bit too much of that right-hand curve, we can spit them into the wall on the left. But if you go in a bit too hot, you could also end up with <laughs> in the wall on the left. It's quite, it's quite tight, that 892. It's going to be interesting with the duels in particular, because, you know, the pressure's on, you've got one flying lap, and if you make a mistake, you run over that inside curve. Yeah, that could be, that could be your time down. It's quite unsettling, actually, in, in the road car, the Maserati road car that went round. So, haven't experienced a Formula E, how, how reactive are they to... Because it's quite a step curve, current. Yeah, I, because of the, the low-profile tyres, you know, you're seeing none of the drivers are actually attacking the, the big high curve. Um, they're all pinching the sort of lower bit off that curve. But, um, yeah, I think if you were here in a touring car or something, you could attack more of it, but I, I can't imagine anyone in one of these really going for it. See the driver soaring away at the wheel. That's Jake Dennis, goes second quickest in the Andretti. What about Nick Casti? He's going to go to the top of the pile here, I think, as he comes to the timing line and does. So good lap time there for him. Teammate Mitch Evans also just slotting himself into fifth place. Bit of an important weekend for Jaguar. Just mentioning, of course, uh, both drivers having uh, difficult weekends. Uh, one in Tokyo for Mitch Evans, and then, of course, in uh, 
Sao Paulo just before that, we saw Nick Cassidy also ending up in the barrier. It's been a been a challenging time for them as of late, and they'll be hoping to uh, sort of bounce back. And given that efficiency is kind of going to be the name of the game, if you look at Porsche, you look at Jaguar, you look at Nissan, they've been the most efficient powertrains this year. So there's every sort of bit of evidence there, DC, to suggest that they're going to be the ones to watch. Yep, I think that um, you start building up a sort of form book, don't you? And although this is quite a different track, confidence carries if you've got your systems working, if the drivers are understanding you know, really how to, to manage everything well. And the, the, the strategy, I think, quality is important, clearly, but nowhere near as important as how they, they, they run this race. So I think that they will be more focused on that than maybe at other tracks. I think, Phil, you look at the last race and Maserati had good energy management, didn't they, with Gunther there. So you've already named three manufacturers, that's adds a fourth. Yeah. All of a sudden, four times, you know, you, you, you've you got four manufacturers, two teams each. Yeah. That's, I think they've all got two teams, haven't they? Uh, well, you've got, you've got DS and you've got Maserati. Ma yeah, same, 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 same yeah. power train. So that's all, you know, so that is... You're looking at 16 cars. Yeah, exactly. Who could all potentially <laughs> win this race? We've all sort of got good energy management. Oh, five different winners in five races. There's every possibility to suggest it could be six from six. But Webby here looks a little bit frustrated as he just comes across the line down to the first corner. He'll be uh, having a chat with this man, team principal Sylvain Felipe. Wonder what's gone on there. To see uh, drivers, by the way, when their names flash pink, that means they're on an attack mode lap. So that gives them 50 kilowatts more power. So they normally run in 300 kilowatts. And then when they go up to 350, that's what they would use in attack mode or when they're in the duels and so on and so forth. So that's uh, just to indicate that some of the drivers are getting those attack laps in now. So Cassidy still fastest then, Verline and Dennis in second and third place. So now just under eight minutes remaining of this session. I was looking a little bit sketchy through those uh, through that chicane there. Someone's going to end up <laughs> doing more than uh, giving a little kiss to the exit barrier. He took, uh, a, big, he took a nibble, didn't he, off the big curb? Yeah. Which happens, it looked like, on the inside. It's, uh, it's just too tempting, isn't it? Even just coming back to what I said earlier about, you know, probably maybe less important here than other tracks, when you're red mist of, you know, full attack, <laughs> you just got to try and steal what you can there, and it's a pretty unforgiving uh, section there at 8 and 9. I see Fritz goes third quickest, Evans into uh, fourth place there as well. Be interesting to see how this session sits out. I wonder if we'll see this man back out, out on track. Max Gunter, we saw him coming to a stop at, uh, at turn 12. And uh, let's see whether he's going to be able to get that car back out for the last few minutes of this session. Crucially, of course, to, to get a practice start would be, uh, would be important, even if it is going to cut short his running here uh, in this session. Stoffland also improving in time. Ah, oh, looks like we are going to get Edo Mortara out on track. So we saw him sitting there with his helmet on in the, uh, I don't know what you would call it, the technical area with the team. There is a pr proper name for that, but I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, well, uh, the engineering racks is, is what I would refer to it as, but um, I am considerably older than yourself, <laughs> and for my terminology, <laughs> may, may be a little bit behind, but uh, yeah, nice seating area for engineers and team management. Let's look here at Jehan Daruvala going into the chicane. Oh, in fact, that's that, not him. No, that's not Daruvala. That's Jake. Hughes, yeah, just going off the track there, Hughes. We saw that earlier on in the session. It's almost like they could trim back the length of the barrier there to not make them go through the gravel, um, just in terms of why bring dust and, and gravel rush. If it, quite clearly, you, you're having to take a, a penalty by not doing the chicane. Um, just an idea. Yeah, I think especially when we get these you know, this peloton race that we're talking about, I can see them going three wide into there. Oh, yeah. And more than one car ending up going through that gravel. So then you get the question of rejoining safely, right? Because it's one thing to go off the track, but actually they're going to be rejoining then at speed, trying to lose the least amount of time. And that's where you start to see things get a bit tricky. Yeah, I think it's going to be hugely interesting. And, and of course, we've got, you know, two races this weekend. It's a double header. First time uh, that we've got a double header since Diria, actually, back in. January. So looking forward to seeing how that is going to change things. But also, crucially, Sunday's race, two laps shorter, but the same amount of allocated energy. So, yeah, be keen to see how that is going to affect things. As we look here at Nick Cassidy sliding his way through. 
final couple of corners. That's through turn 13, kicking up a bit of dust as he goes into the final corner of turn 14. We'll see him exploring the track limits as he does on board and comes across the timing line. Where's he go? It is fastest of the lot, a 117.9. Spoke to Jake Hughes in rookie free practice earlier on. He said the times they were setting in the sim was a 118.9, so they're already a second underneath that. Yeah, track um, is in good condition. Doesn't look particularly dusty. And beautiful, no, it's not quite sunset, but it's a beautiful sunny evening here for them to be out there. Track temp, and it's not going to give them any issues getting the tires in, so he's pretty handy, Nick, isn't he? Yeah, not bad at all. Looking here at Nico Muller, uh, points on the door for the Apt Cupra team last time out, managing to break their run and also crucially leapfrog Mahindra in the championship, so customer now ahead of factory team. But I uh, spoke to Mahindra actually earlier on in the weekend, and they not expecting the efficiency to be particularly brilliant for them here this weekend and uh, you know fine in qualifying getting a good grid position but given the position change we're expecting in the race come the you know come the race on saturday i think that's why they'll regret the mortara penalty in tokyo isn't it because actually he did a, a super job in qualifying to get up the third and then you know in the race hung on to the top six and that was a good good haul of points or would have been a good haul of points if not for the disqualification yeah I think he could again, as I was saying before, he could do that in Tokyo because it was quite a narrow track and you could hold the pack behind. And Roland was backing the pack up. Here, you got no chance. If you haven't got the um, energy efficiency here, you could be quite exposed. You know, I'm just looking by my eye there. You could get four cars across quite easily, couldn't you? <laughs> On the run down that straight. So um, we're going to see a bit of that. Yeah, so just over three minutes of the session now, and let's get down to Saunders uh, to chat to team principal for Jaguar, James Barkley. Nick Casti currently fastest in this session, Saunders. He is indeed, and I'm in the underbelly of the Jaguar TCS operation uh, with James Barkley. As it looks at the timings, things are pretty good for Nick. Yeah, it's uh, FP1, there's a long way to go, but um, yeah, it's an important session just to get a view of what the track's like uh, in comparison to the simulator and just seeing if... Uh, if, yeah, we, we've got a good good operating balance and preparation ahead of, ahead of tomorrow. So coming off the back of Tokyo, I think obviously a, a better result was on the cards, but really, really good display of performance from Cassidy, uh, just talking about him to begin with. What's possible for the race? Because we know this is really going to separate the uh, the cats amongst the pigeons. Yeah, I mean, firstly, yeah, Tokyo wasn't an wasn't ideal weekend for us. The reality is we had good car performance. We just didn't extract a great weekend. You know, it happens and, yeah, we've... Took, taken away the learnings from that weekend um, but yeah this this race is a completely different game right Tokyo that traditional Formula E 90 degree corners bumpy the jumps it was everything you see from Formula E this is complete opposite you know really fast really smooth it's going to be a big strategic race for sure uh, both races of this weekend are going to be a, a very much a peloton strategy style race so yes qualifying is always important but ultimately it's going to be about timing timing your strategy managing your energy accordingly positioning the cars correctly and being there at the end to try and fight for the podium. I'm sold. Thanks, James. Cheers, thanks. Yeah, thanks, James. Thanks, Saunders. Just saw Robin Frights going a little bit wide there into turn 12. Not going to be a lap time to improve uh, for him. Stay 17th fastest. It almost looked like he was uh, practicing for going through the attack mode. Um, he did actually go across the, the beacons, but he, he entered it in a way that was like, oh, I'm out of control. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe he was out of control and then decided to turn it into something for the practice. Very Formula E. So a minute left of this session, Muller just popped himself up to third quickest in the Apps Cooper. Looking here at Mitch Evans as well, who's on a bit of a flyer at the moment. He's gone fastest of the lot in the second sector. What is the key we're going to be able to do as he comes to the timing line? Is it going to be an improvement? It is third fastest then for uh, Mitch Evans. Good start to the day for Jaguar. Good for Diaz Penske, both drivers up there inside the top ten. John Verne in uh, 12th place, Stoffel van Dorn into sixth position. We heard from Phil Charles earlier on. And we alluded to, or sort of alluded to him as the strategy guru, and I think that, that is going to be absolutely critical this weekend as we just look at Mitch Evans coming through the final corner, and that's the problem with exceeding track limits and having a bit of grass. Yeah, but it's... Well, I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? Because the, the circuit... The circuit is actually about three feet to his left. So, um, I, I don't know. I could get bogged down in track limits all weekend, so I'm going to try and refrain. Someone's had a lock up here into T1 as well, and Ollie Rowland's just followed them off in a bit of uh, sympathy there as well. <laughs> you often see that actually if somebody locks up in front, unless uh, some sort of uh, dust or liquid has gone down, uh, which is possible but unlikely. 
Uh, it's almost, as you say, like a sympathy follow the leader into the uh, down the escape road. Yeah, impressive performance also from Oliver Rowland. Of course, three podiums in three races, and you wonder, as the checkered flag is now out, what the efficiency of the Nissan is going to look like uh, this weekend. 11th fastest it is for Rowland at the moment, as Van Dorn just pops it in quickest at the end of the session. Vern on a bit of a flyer here as well. Likewise, Jonathan Vern, this is where we're going to now see the fast lap times coming in. All the drivers in attack mode, so the maximum 350 kilowatts of power. What does Sam Bird do in the Neon McLaren? He improves up to eighth fastest, loses a little bit of time there in that final sector. Freitz goes 11th quickest. Fenestras improving up to uh, 16th there as well. Jonathan Vern's the man on the move at the moment in that second sector, fastest overall. And let's see what Jeb is going to be able to do as he comes to the timing line. And he does go fastest as the DS Penske 1 2 at the end of free practice one. And the final corner here for uh, Nick de Vries in the Sol Mahindra in this session. No time, unfortunately, for Eduardo Mortara owing to technical problems. De Vries concludes that in 19th place. But uh, as the checker flag falls, a very strong start for DS Penske leading 1 and 2 here. Yeah, they've been quick all the way through, right from the very beginning. It looks like drivers hooked up, confident. I think this is, um, again, something about their team. They always seem still, to be uh, able decent to get enough to be P1. Really? Yeah. Mm, I like this. I like this. Yeah, they always seem to be able to get the tires switched on when they come to a, a hot track in a hot race and that and I think around the circuit because it's a fast track as well they'll be able to energize the tires and lean on the tires to get the temperature up um, and that's that's going to be crucial for qualifying but as David rightly said before qualifying here much less important than at most other countries over. no absolutely we'll see what happens uh, also Jay Anderubla shout out to him as well rookie season in Formula Renault it's only free practice one but fourth quickest that's not yeah. a bad time for him yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, well it's confidence isn't it it just, you know, you much rather be there than at the other end of the time. So that'll that'll just give him a little bit of a boost overnight um, as he comes back to practice more. Yep. So drivers now doing their uh, practice starts incredibly wide. It seems a Formula Recall. It's almost minuscule here at this track. If you compare it to, you know, Tokyo a couple of weeks ago, they're threading the other needle around there, and they look like the right size. They almost look like scale electric cars around here. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's just different, but I think it's good, you know, we've got a mix this year, which is different to previous season, I think we've got, is it 60% of the races are on permanent facilities this yeah, year? Yeah, it's, it's a good one, do you know, we, we were working this out over lunch, and I can't remember what percentage we came to, but it was around that sort of number, and, you know, that's the sort of the, the way that things are, you know, are going now, and... Yeah, it, it, it's good though because it gives us unpredictability. You know, we get races like Tokyo, tight, twisty street circuits. We come to something like this, and you yeah. can't find out what the form book's going to be. No one's got any idea. Yeah, because we're going Portland, Misano, Shanghai. Yep. And there's one other one. Uh, hang on a minute. Oh, Where I'm are we Misano. going next? We go to Monaco, then Berlin. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's it. So it's yeah. those three, but they're all double headers, aren't they? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so Monaco's six. the only single header until the end of the season. Then. That's it. So it's it's not it's quite. It's not sixty percent. It's forty percent. Mm. It's a good portion of them. Mm. Here's Antonio Felix da Costa making his way down uh, to the Weybridge as he uh, finishes that session eleventh quickest. So not a bad day at the office for him and teammate Pascal Verline, ninth and eleventh. They'll be. They're relatively happy with that, you know, final finishing position, not necessarily that relevant at the end of free practice one. But Jeff there, quickest of the lot, and he'll be delighted with that because teammate Stoffel Van Dorn was just two tenths of a second away. Diaz Penske 1-2 at the end of free practice one then. John Eric Verne leads from Stoffel Van Dorn. Nick Casti in third place, head of Jay Handerubla in fourth position. Then Mitch Evans inside the top five in the second of the Jags. Uh, then it's the Swiss 6-7, Nico Muller ahead of Sebastian Buemi and then Sam Bird in eighth place ahead of Pascal Verline. Sergio Sese camera inside the top 10 for ERT. He's been a bit of a shining star for that team. But also not bad for Dan Tictum in 13th place ahead of Lucas Degrassi. Jake Hughes down there in 15th ahead of Fenestras. Jake Dennis reigning champion, 17th position for him and teammate Norman Natto also only 20th fastest as well. So work to do for them going into free practice two tomorrow and qualifying tomorrow morning. Let's see what happens as the show continues.
Well, that is great news for the DS Penske team to see jean eric Verne and Stoffel van Dorn on top, which is actually... Um, well, they need a bit of good luck, actually. I feel like Stoffel van Dorn, who, of course, is a former Formula E world champion, as is jean eric Verne, but he's currently sitting down 13th in the championship at the moment. So perhaps this could be a bit of a turning point. Perhaps their uh, their luck will change here in Mazzano, Katie. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's only free practice one, but I know as a driver how much confidence it gives you when you're out in the first session and you're on the pace. I think, I think that's massive and it's not to be underestimated. We did see Stoffel going straight on at the chicane very early on into the free practice. He's obviously testing the limits. Um, but yeah, I think the lap times have been quick. They're already much quicker than they were in the sims that uh, Jake Hughes was telling us that he set in McLaren earlier in the week. Oh, this is why we love Antonio Felix da Costa. Why? He was going to get weighed early, and I was like, could you please, would you mind doing a quick interview? He did say no, but I was hoping he was joking. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. I'm very happy to be here in Mzano. The sun is shining, and I'm standing next to Katie Munnings. Very Life nice doesn't get much better. Yeah. Um, privilege. Shall I just get straight to the point? Because obviously there has been a bit of breaking news about you. So I'm there sorry. Hasn't been any news. If if we just get it done and out of the way for the weekend, we don't have to mention it again. It's a no. Um, so I will have to just quickly explain to the viewers because we're very early on in the show and we haven't really got into it. But basically there was a uh, a bit of breaking news earlier um, in the week that uh, there were maybe cracks in the relationship with yourself and Portia. Those are not breaking news, those are speculations speculations i would agree with you on that it is all rumor and it's all speculation the one thing that did happen was that nico muller did do a test in season with your team uh, which had been confirmed can you give us any more insight onto your position within the team at the moment um obviously we had a tough start to the season and um, yeah i don't know it's I think we're all grown-ups and we've all uh, been doing this for a long time, so the plan is longevity um, with, with each other and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to, you know, to, to get everything back on track and the last two races have been good, so I think we've reacted well to the poor start of, of the season. We've started our climb back to the, to the last two rounds. I was able to gain points on the championship leader, so we'll keep doing that and uh, what will be will be. But honestly, I, you know, when you race for a brand like Porsche, it's, you're living the dream, you know? So that hasn't changed, that will never change. And um, yeah, uh, just want to do my job, have fun driving, which I am having fun again. Driving, we're back on the pace, so it's all good. Yeah, I mean, the last couple of the races, you've had some fantastic results, fifth and sixth, I believe. It was fourth and sixth, I think, yeah. Shall we just check on this? I'm not lying. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I, do tr I trust him, sort of. No, yeah. um, okay. but no, it's important to get points on the board, a, a critical point in your career with Porsche. Absolutely. I'm not naive. Look, it's a sport that uh, if you're not performing, they have to look elsewhere. And yes, the start of the season was poor, but I just focus on my driving. I have a very good uh, technical team around, the, around me that is pushing hard to... to Give me the confidence to be happy in the car and we've been doing that been been building a nice momentum and uh, we're going to keep doing it brilliant well that's what we like to hear well quickly then give us your thoughts Mizano. yeah i know it's a bit of a moto gp vibe here mm -hmm. but um you know it in a way i'm a little bit sad to leave rome because that was one of the most coolest tracks that we've had um and we're here in Mizano in a permanent circuit a very different way to to approach to to set up the cart even the race is going to be so different you know we're going to see one of those chaotic races with a lot of energy saving um it is what it is um hopefully the fans will will have a big turnout and uh, i'm sure the, the race will be in a chaotic in a spectacular way and uh, hopefully we'll keep it clean and have a good one tomorrow and well thank you we do really appreciate it antonio chatting to us uh, good luck for the race for, weekend uh, thanks for putting me on the spot uh, <laughs> we, tr we try <laughs> thank you well there we are antonio Pete's cost we did wonder uh, if he would talk to us this weekend so it was nice to have a chat and um, dc katie you are both in well perfect positions hopefully it hasn't happened to you before but just explain to us how it feels when you're not told and they're just it, it gets out into the the rumor mill that one of your competitors has just done a private test at your team for your seat how, how does that make you feel yeah i mean obviously it, it's a really tough one and at the minute as as he kind of handles it perfectly you know he's, he's he's focused on the job at hand he seems to be on top of things and actually his results have been really good in the last few races it depends who he is as a driver i think sometimes you need a, a bit of a kick to fire you up and some people would yeah. really affect him so i think he's handled it really well yeah dc i will get your answer in a moment but at the moment kareem chanuk is with our season two formula e champion sebastian Wemi. over to you 
Yeah, thank you, Nikki. Sebastian Buwain, thank you for coming down to chat with us. Um, uh, can you first of all try and explain to everyone at home what are the rules on track limits? Because David and I were in the commentary box and we were very confused. So uh, can you try and just explain this to us? Yeah, so there are lots of different rules. So I don't know if you've seen, but there is a few banana curbs on the outside of yeah. a few corners. So obviously there, they have a camera, but uh, at the same time, you don't want to go there. Obviously, you're going to damage the car. Uh, all the other exit where we don't have a banana, it, you've basically got to touch the, the curb, still be in contact with the curb, not the white line. So ah, for example, okay. the last corner, you've got to be touching the curb. Uh, exit of turn four and seven, well, there's we no... This? Yeah, and yeah. You, can, you can tell us as, yeah. as okay. we're going on. But, so uh, no track limits on the inside here in turn one. Okay. Uh, obviously the banana at the exit here. We don't really see it, but yeah. yeah. Well, what's it like here? Because it looks like quite a tricky braking zone. You've got to brake and turn all the way yeah. around into. two. The car is quite loose there, and obviously you're running out of uh, rear left, uh, so it's not easy to keep the traction out of that place. And here there is no track limit, so you can go up to the grass. Okay. Quite simple. Um, turn five, obviously, here. Uh, I noticed, uh, Seb, on the inside here, a lot of drivers using the blue on the inside. Yeah. You, you were choosing a slightly wider line? Yeah, obviously you're trying to go from time to time there. If you manage and you don't outbreak yourself, uh, it's a bit more rough, obviously, there, but it, you do less meters. So, um, you know, you've got to see exactly what you think is best. Here in turn seven, I don't think it makes that much sense because it upset the car too much. Right. But in five, I do agree that sometimes getting that apex uh, will help. Uh, now, I want to ask you here, because in the race, we, we think it's going to be lots of streaming, lots of yeah. sort of peloton style. Um, when you're coming down the straight, there's not much room for more than one car, yeah. <laughs> the chicane. Yes. Uh, do you see this being a bit of a bit chaotic when you get yeah, to the race? Yeah, it will be. I mean, it's, it's really wide here, and then it gets really narrow. So as yeah. you can expect, it's going to be really difficult. Mm. I, I don't necessarily like that type of corner, but you know, that's the way it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll have to deal with it. And there's a big curb on the right-hand side as well. Which yeah, you, you can't obviously take, take it much. Yeah. Maybe the, the flat bit, but no, not more. And here, that's the high-speed section with uh, turn 11 and 12. You've got the banana there, so it's you know, got to make sure you don't uh, touch them. Here, you, you can cut the inside if you want, but again, it's, it's a bit rough and it upset a bit the car. Yeah. Here, you've got, again, both bananas, so you don't really want to go. Now, I will say, we saw some drivers, and I'll just go back a little bit. We yeah. saw other drivers running all the way along there. To prepare the lap to or to finish the lap? Well, to finish the lap. Yeah. Would yeah, you, you do can. that? Obviously, it's, it's always a, a compromise. You try to run a low car, and obviously, if you go there, it's going to be kind of rough. You know, it's upsetting a bit the car, but it's yeah. true that it does open the corner quite a bit. So, uh, you know, it, I'm still experimenting somehow. I try to do it in the end laps, you know, see yeah. what the best lines are. And um, I'll continue tomorrow, hopefully, by qualifying. I know exactly where to drive. OK, listen, thank you very much for joining us. Good luck for the weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Back to you. Well, thanks very much, Karine and Sebastian Buemi there. Now, let's uh, rewind to what we were just discussing earlier, because I'd love to get your thoughts as well, DC. Has that ever, ever happened to you where, you know, you've known that the competition is coming and the team is looking elsewhere? Sorry, You're I was just. I, I, I am. That car looks so unbelie clean. You, you never know it's been out there for free <laughs> practice. You a very important question. They, they <laughs> were. They were very fast, and it's a very shiny car. It that was nice. Stoffel Van Dorn's uh, car there that just passed. Uh, yeah, it did happen to me. Where uh, McLaren, I did nine seasons with them, but at the end of season seven, they told me they'd signed Montoya. Um, so it gave me over a year to to try and find a solution which amazingly I hadn't found a solution by the end of my ninth season with McLaren. But um, yeah, look, it's part of the industry, I think. I've always said uh, racing drivers are like light bulbs. As soon as they start to dim, the teams just very quickly screw that one out and stick another one in. It's, it's the nature of motor racing that you've got to perform. And you're only as good as your last race and all those sort of cliches. And ultimately, that's what you're paid to do. You know, you need to perform. That's what you're here to do. And, and if you're not, then, of course, there is the potential that your, your job could be on the line. Yeah, I love that line from Jenny Maguire. This isn't show friends, this is show business. So, you know, if it, everyone, if you were just doing friends, then we'd all stay married as racing drivers uh, to the teams yeah. for the, however long their careers last. Absolutely. Now, uh, another beautifully clean and shiny car that we're standing next to is the car of Max Gunter, our race winner from Tokyo last, last time out. The car is in pieces because he has a technical issue. Um, he said he lost the brakes and the power shut down. Not sounding great um, for someone who is hopefully going to carry on that momentum from last time out 
again, how much of an impact is this going to have psychologically, assuming that the car is ready for tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, he looked a bit upset when he walked past us just now here in the pit lane. Um, I, if it's going to happen in a session, FP1 is an OK session for that to happen in. You know, you're still getting to the grips with the track. They have good data from the other Maserati as well. A lot of it is, as you say, going to be about energy management this weekend. So although qualifying is important, I think as a team, they should really pull together and, and make sure that they've got their strategy for the race in terms of energy management, which they proved they can do a good, good job of in Tokyo. And on the other side of the garage, we've got Jehan Daruvula, who finished P4 in that practice session, DC. Yeah, strong session. So um, he, I think he needs it. He needs to, to, to have that sort of confidence carry into the weekend. I think he had one little excursion, then he threw the gravel at turn eight and nine, just uh, exploring what uh, Karun was actually saying, that maybe in the race we'll see two or three cars going there because there'll be four abreast going into that turn. Yeah, he's been here before in F3, so he's got circuit knowledge, and I think that's been helpful to get get off on the right foot. But you're absolutely right, he needs a big weekend, and uh, he started well, so it's good. Yeah, I feel like half the grid has been here before. Well, in fact, half the grid has been here before. <laughs> um, but let's go down to Saunders, who's with Mitch Evans. So, Mitch Evans, tell me, what's it like out there? Um, not too bad. I just miss Rome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's a uh, challenging, challenging little venue. Um, a lot of like obviously flowing corners and you know unconventional corners for formerly so yeah just trying to get car in the right window understand how the tires will uh behave around here but um yeah overall uh, solid session i'd say very different circuit very different style of racing but the the jaguar package is very efficient it, it can really make the most of situations like this yeah no for sure I, look i think we're still lacking a little bit compared to porsche in terms of efficiency but Overall package, you know, we've got, we got a really strong package, but still, we've still got to put together when it counts. So, um, and, you know, normally we're, we're slightly favoured towards street tracks with our package, and, you know, this track probably wouldn't suit us as much, but I was, you know, surprised with the first, first session. Um, let, let, let's see, but I think, you know, in the race, it's going to be, it's going to be mayhem, so um, track position may not be so critical, but uh, still, you want, you want a good package right now. Thanks, Mitch. Cool, thanks. Always good to hear from Mitch Evans, who's had big changes, of course, this season with that new teammate, his bestie, uh, Nick Casty, coming in. But in terms of his season so far, Karun, I mean, there have been highs, there have been obviously some lows, some difficult moments, but he's usually a relatively consistent driver in Formula E. He is, but I think that change to having Cassidy on the other side of the pit garage, you know, normally, as a driver, you just focus on your job, you do what you've got to do, and what happens the other side happens. But I think there is a change there because all of a sudden Cassie's arrived and has performed at a very high level straight away. He's won a race already, um, got ahead of Mitch in, in Diria quite early on in the season. And, and I think that, that has sort of upset the, um, the comfort blanket, should we say, that Mitch had in the past because he, he had Sam Bird covered a little bit, didn't he, for the last couple of seasons. So, um, yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting dynamic there considering they grew up driving go-karts together from the age of five. Um, but he's got to lift his game. <laughs>